This is a presentation about the VOR approach with the A320. Tips and tricks. Hopefully it will be useful. First a disclaimer. This presentation is for guidance only. The FCOM, FCTM and the company manuals always take precedence. And please use common sense and good airmanship. So a VOR approach is more complex and has a higher workload compared to an ILS. It requires thorough preparation. It might have some FMS coding if issues, uh, such as different versions between different FMSs, and sometimes also the coding is incorrect. VOR approaches are relatively rare. They are becoming increasingly rare as a lot of VORs are being either uh, decommissioned or replaced by uh, ILS approaches or RNAV approaches. Because it is uh, more complex than an ILS, it does require some practice. First, some definitions. There are different um, ways to fly a VOR approach and um, I want to discuss a, a couple of uh, um, definitions I use which are not necessarily used uh, officially but because there are no official words for some of these concepts I just made up some um, uh, words. Uh, the platform altitude is uh, quite widely used in the industry although it's not an official term. So the, um, the platform altitude is basically the altitude uh, after which you start a continuous uh, not necessarily a continuous descent, but uh, start the inbound descent. So in, in this chart here, the platform altitude uh, would be uh, right here. And you can either do a uh, shallow descent initially or uh, dive down to the final project's altitude here. Either way, the platform altitude will be this altitude right there. In this case, you will fly overfly the, um, you fly level up at the platform altitude, overfly the descent point and fly a continuous descent after. So this will still be the platform altitude. And in this case, in order to fly a continuous descent, you will fly at the platform altitude somewhat higher and uh, start the descent at the published point here. So that we call the platform altitude. Next, the final approach fix. That is an industry standard term. Uh, usually it is a star on the chart. There are of course different manufacturers of um, of the for the for the charts but the, the vast majority of them use a symbol similar to this some, some star like that the final descent point that's a airbus term um, that is the point after which a continuous descent is coded and to know what that point is you will have to look at the fms coding so here's a photo of uh, fms uh, which is actually this in the secondary flight plan um, and then you can see you have to look at the three degree coding at um, the VOR approach. So here in this case there are two three degree, three degree uh, coding sections. So the the last point on the fly plan here that's the missed approach point and between the next point and that there's three degrees and between that point and the one before also three degrees. So the point after which a um, continuous descent is coded will be in this case SD35. So this is the final descent point. Next, the charted descent point. This is a term I myself made up to indicate uh, at what point the chart tells you to start descending. So if the, if the chart looks like this, that without the dotted uh, a red line then this point here will be the charted descent point um, uh, just like all the other points that is not necessarily the point where you want to start to descend but the uh, point where the chart shows you where you should start the descent that I'll call the charted descent point then there is a calculated descent point this is also a term I made up myself to indicate where in the case that if you don't want to start the descent at the charted descent point but you want to fly a continuous descent then you have to recalculate the descent point in case the platform altitude is a non-standard altitude so in this case here the if the fms lets you dive down and fly level towards the altitude which is at the final fix here 
and then you, you might not want to do that so you have to recalculate like in this case you fly level keep flying level and then you descend later so that you fly a continuous descent after and this point here where you start to descend that will be then the calculated descent point it is uh, wise to uh, be well prepared if you fly a VOR approach because there are many things which are somewhat uh, um, different than with an ILS approach one thing you want to do is to have the runway track ready because if the autopilot uh, is being turned off by the pilot flying you'll say uh, set runway track and if you then have to look for the runway track where was it again i forgot what it was and look at the chart where which chart is it oh yes i have to go to the and this chart here and ah oh, there it is 115 yeah you don't want to do that of course next for preparation for radar vectoring so if you will fly a straight in approach you have to note the reciprocal of the final approach track in order to make an extended runway center line using the direct to radio in feature to intercept the uh, approach track and nav so you can see that here here we're getting uh, we're being radar vectored for a VOR approach and then we're getting a heading heading um, of uh, 360 here I think later it's a bit more to the right let me see here yeah so the final heading is heading 030 clear for the approach well the way you do that is you arm nav but that will only work of course if you have a uh, radial out <clears throat> from the point um, the, the the last point on the the fly plane here <clears throat> so if you then arm nav here then it will automatically uh, intercept that um, that radial so that's important to have that number ready before because you have to calculate the opposite or so the reciprocal of the final approach track not the approach track itself then for an offset approach you need to know the direction where to look and um, where uh, which way you have to uh, turn a final and and how early you have to turn final in case there's a, a crosswind and we'll get back to that later you have to know when to configure when to select flap and when to select the gear and uh, calculate when to pull fpa if vertically sele uh, selected and uh, non-standard altitudes are used and again i will get back to that later how to do that there might be uh, some uh, sop differences uh, one thing for sure you have to do uh, high checks and uh, once the autopilot is being turned off by pilot flying we'll say autopilot off flight directors off send runway track so that's an sop you you don't do on on an ils so that's only where you are and or for non-precision approach and there might be some other company specific sops more preparation for the fms setup you want to set maximum 240 knots from the initial approach fix or 250 knots for uh, a321 and um, one thing which it mentions in the uh, F fcom that uh, you have to set the uh, v up at the uh, final descent point but actually that uh, has no effect you can see that here this is uh, we're being uh, on final for a VOR approach and the VAP is uh, set in the FMS here at this waypoint um, which is actually the final approach fix it used to be in the FCOM uh, some time ago but actually it's been changed to uh, you have to set this at the final descent point not the final approach fix but either way it will have no effect because by the time you are at the final descent point or the final approach fix the approach phase will already be activated and once the approach phase is activated the aircraft will not fly the managed speed anymore unless you have flap full selected so uh, if you um, fly at green dot it will do uh, or if fly near green dot um, and the approach phase is activated it will just fly green dot and it will completely ignore any speed which is set in the fms uh, same for if um, flap one is selected it will fly s speed and it will completely ignore any speed in the fms and uh, same with flap 2 and flap 3 etc then you need to set the retnav um, at the at the retnav page in the fms you need to set the vor and the course of that and most companies have the procedure to add 50 feet to the minima although not all so please check your company procedures you might have to add 50 feet to the minima 
if the hold has to be flown before flying the procedure, then set the overhead altitude about 4,500 feet higher if that's allowed by the procedure, because 15 miles from the hold will be missing in the track miles. So for example, if you fly this approach here, if you come from the south, then you can't fly directly outbound like that because you'll be outside of 30 degrees from this track here. So what you have to do is you enter the hold like that and then turn left into the hold and then you go inbound in the hold and outbound on the procedure. And But if the aircraft is flying here, this these track miles from, from that, that teardrop procedure into the hold that will not be in the FMS. Uh, at the, it, it will be in the FMS but it will not be added to the amount of track miles. You will see depending on the FMS type sometimes when you just approach that point or with other FMS versions if you're overhead suddenly it will will add about 15 miles, 1.5 miles to the track miles and that will cause you to be um, too low for descent energy management. So that's actually a bit of a waste of fuel. You, you should have uh, descended uh, later from the top of descent to make up for that. So if the procedure allows you to fly higher here, so in this case you, you can, and you have to fly this altitude or higher in this case. So then you can, in the FMS, increase this to uh, so 15 times three, so 4,500 feet um, higher for uh, for the descent management so in order to save fuel. Then you need to check the chart versus the FMS vertical coding and, and, and also the lateral coding. It has to be within uh, 0 0.1 uh, degree for the vertical coding and 1 degree for the lateral coding. So here's the picture of the VOR approach again on the FMS. So we're checking this this degrees, these degrees here. So in this case, this is three degrees, and then you compare that with the chart. So here's the chart, and here on the chart it also says it's three degrees. So in this case, we can do that uh, managed uh, vertically. Then after the initial descent, uh, set the next lower altitude or set the go around altitude. Now this might depend on your companies. Uh, some companies want you to set the next lower altitude, for example, the final approach fixed altitude uh, once you start the, the descent, and some might want you to set the go around altitude once you start your descent. So either way, uh, please check your company procedures. Um, the one thing to note about that though, that if you are required to set the next lower altitude, this uh, has an issue that if the aircraft will go into alt star you don't want to do that because you want to fly continuous descent unless of course you are too low on profile then you want it to go into alt star to prevent an altitude bust but if it goes into alt star it will start to raise the nose and this will increase the workload because then you have to set uh, a higher altitude with the go around altitude and then modify the fpa again to keep it on track so just keep that in mind So you also want to check uh, how to fly if the hold does not match up with the approach procedure. So here's an example of uh, a uh, uh, procedure where if you fly in the hold that you can't just fly the teardrop procedure. You can see the hold is right there and let's say okay you're uh, clear for the approach now and then from this point you, you can't just make that turn here to fly that outbound track because again you have to be in you have to be within uh, 30 degrees to fly either an inbound or an outbound track so the procedure has another uh, way to do that uh, to fly the racetrack pattern here and then you go when you're on the outbound on the hold then you can fly this 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 uh, leg here in order to intercept that um, in the intercept the procedure but unfortunately, it, it's not possible to uh, code this in the FMS. There's no such thing as this as a racetrack pattern. It's either uh, just a hold or um, a, a teardrop procedure like that or, or via the arc. But uh, if, uh, when you are on this leg of the hold here, you, you cannot uh, fly outbound like that. 
not, not any way um, to retrieve this from the database. It is not possible. So you can still fly it, but you have to do it differently. You have to make a waypoint here in the FMS and then with the radio outbound and then just uh, heading selected and then eyeball it to maintain on that heading either that or you once you are uh, or you you can also make that uh, that that uh, rate you can do direct direct um, to uh, inbound leg and that will work also either way you have to do some uh, manual work in order to get uh, this procedure to fly uh, using a race track pattern so keep uh, keep that in mind the other thing is you want to decide whether you have to fly the approach uh, managed, managed or selected or fully managed or fully selected and we'll go we'll get back to that later then if you fly it fully managed then when to arm the approach now you want to do this when the final descent the, the final descent point is the active waypoint so i discussed before to uh, figure out how, what the uh, final descent point is but let's just have a quick look at it again so we want to look um, for the three degree uh, paths here the vertical paths of three degrees or any other um, vertical uh, number in this case it's three degrees but there are two points here where there's a three degree path coded and the last one is this one so the waypoint before that which is sd35 in this case so after this waypoint there's a f uh, continuous three degree path coded so sd35 that will be then the final descent point so when this waypoint is active on the navigation display that's the moment where you can arm the approach if you fly it fully managed so if you fly an approach where there's a low platform altitude, you want to decide if you uh, fly actually at that lower platform altitude and configure earlier or modify that altitude to fly higher. So here's an example of a VOR approach with a low platform altitude, which is only 2000 feet. Then, okay, you can fly at 2000 feet, but then you have to start to configure a bit earlier because at this moment here, when you start to uh, descend, you want to be either fully configured if you do it as selected or uh, at least uh, flap two before that and gear down uh, when you're over this, this point, the final approach fix in this case. So uh, what you can also do is instead of flying level at 2000 feet, uh, fly level at 3000 feet if this is allowed by the procedure. So you have to check that on and, and if you're not sure, uh, ask ATC if you can maintain level at 3000 feet and then um, then you can uh, fly the approach in a bit more standardized way. If you fly single engine, you might need to land with flap three because you cannot uh, level off with a uh, gear down flap full with a single engine approach. Going back to the previous chart here in Hong Kong with a VOR approach. So in this case, um, Okay, let's say you fly level at 2,000 feet, then you can't, normally, you, you, before that you will say, you, you will be fully configured, yeah, because um, with a non-standard approach, you want to do that as a, uh, you know, to be f f fully configured before the final descent point, which is here, which happens to be at the final approach fix also. So, if, um, but, but if you do that, you know, you will be geared down and flap full before that, and then you will fly level with uh, gear down flap full single engine, and you can't do that. So you have to do that either differently. You can, you could arguably select um, um, pull FBA 0.3 miles before, and and then select flap full. You you could do that, or fly higher at 3,000 feet, and then start the descent a bit um, further, uh, a bit earlier, and then configure on the approach when you are descending. You can do that also, if that is allowed by the procedure and allowed by ATC. Uh, you might need to make uh, VOR height check tables. Um, I have another slide to explain how that works. If the final descent point is after the point where you should start a continuous descent, you need to descend selected initially. So I can use this chart as an example. Now, if the, there's only one three degree path coded, then the final descent point will be the final approach fix. So you have to 
pass these, the, the, this waypoint first before you can arm the approach. But actually, the descent, the, the continuous descent starts before that. If you would fly level at uh, 3,000, uh, round it up 3,300 feet here, and then uh, wait until the final descent point is active, you are already past the point where you should start to descend. So this you cannot do. So in that case, you have to start selected initially start the descent selected initially and once the final approach um, final descent point is the active waypoint then you can arm the approach so depending on company policy you might have to do a step descent so drive, dive and drive or a continuous descent so please check your company procedures but most companies they use a continuous descent for a VR approach Managed versus selected. So when to use a managed approach and when to do a selected approach. In, or, in order to, uh, to do a fully managed approach, which means you arm the approach and then you arm final app. So initially that will be final app blue and once it's active, it'll be a final app green. Uh, that is only allowed if all these conditions are met. So you have to be clear for the approach. The active waypoint is the final descent point. GPS primary or accuracy high available. The maximum difference between the FMS coding and the charted final vertical path is 0.1 degree. Uh, similar, the maximum difference between the charted and the lateral track of the FMS is uh, 1 degree. The outside air temperature is more than ISO minus 15, which is 0 degrees at sea level. The approach is in the, is in the database and it's not manually built. Too steep path is not displayed after the final descent point in the FMS. And final app is not recommended if the aircraft will dive and drive. This is not in the FCOM, this is my own recommendation. And again, it also depends on company procedures because some companies they do actually want you to dive and drive. So when to use managed selected, so enough FPA. Uh, that is if, uh, so with one star, that's not true. So if uh, GPS primary or accuracy high is not available, then you have to do uh, manage selected. Uh, the, uh, if the difference between the FMS and the chart is more than 0.1 degree, you have to do it manage selected. And if, the, if there's cold weather, uh, ISA minus uh, 15 degrees, uh, colder than that, and then you have to do it manage selected. And too steep path is, is displayed after the final descent point, you have to do it manage selected. And um, if uh, the aircraft will dive and drive, then I recommend you do this manage selected, unless the comp your company tells you otherwise. Now when to fly the approach selected selected, so track FPA, that is if both stars are not true or accuracy, NAV accuracy is low. If NAV accuracy is low, then you also have to fly it in track FPA. But so if uh, the difference between the FMS coding and the chart coding is more than one degree, you have to do that selected selected. And also if the approach is not in the database and it's manually built, then you have to fly it uh, fully selected. So let's talk about a fully managed approach. This is the least amount of workload. Uh, flap balloon is not an issue once you are in final app. And you can see that's here. This is a fully managed approach. Flap tree has just been selected. Now flap tool is selected. The aircraft will balloon slightly, as you see here. But because it's in final app, it's kind of similar to an ILS where it's locked on this uh, vertical path here. We'll just fly back to it automatically. You don't have to do anything. So it will just increase the vertical speed to capture that path again. And once it's back on the vertical path, then it will uh, fly uh, that vertical path again. Well, the outer pilot has just been selected, so that doesn't apply here, but that's the way it works. After arming approach, a blue descent arrow should be visible on the NT, otherwise final app engagement conditions are not met. And you can see that here. Well, in this case, there are uh, two arrows. Um, this is the this first one is where the aircraft will level off. That's not the arrow we're looking at. We're looking for the descent arrow. So if I skip ahead a bit more, so here. So this is a blue descent arrow. That means that the aircraft should go into final app. 
Having a level segment before the final descent point makes configuring easier. Uh, select flap 2 about 1 mile before the final descent point if you fly at 3000 feet. The rest of the configuration is the same as an ILS. So you can see that here we're flying level at 3000 feet so we can select flap 2 1 mile before the final descent point. At the, at the moment still flap 1, there's flap 2 about 1 mile before the final descent point. If, it, if you would fly a uh, an ILS approach. You would you would get the if you would fly level at 3,000 feet, you would see the the glide slope diamond coming in, and when it's one dot below the glide slope, you can select flap two. But of course, with an, a VOR approach, you can't see that. So that's why we use a distance instead. So about one mile before the final descent point, and then we can just intercept the path in uh, final up here and when to select the gear that will be the same as with an ILS depending on your speed if the speed is on the high side then you want to select the gear at 2500 feet above the ground and when the speed is on the low, low side like in this case you can select the gear down at around about 2000 feet above the ground above the airfield elevation I should say okay so if I skip ahead a bit so there's 2000 feet coming up okay we can select the gear down and uh, shortly after we can select flap 3 and then flap full uh, not later than 1900 feet if the speed is low so, so if I skip it a bit okay so there's flap 3 and then flap full so this will be the same as with an ILS but this is only for a fully managed VOR approach if the platform altitude is below 3000 feet uh, force it at 3000 feet if allowed uh, or configure earlier and this is what we talked about before like in this case where the platform altitude is very low then you either have to select a bit earlier or force the aircraft to fly higher at 3000 feet and then select as I mentioned uh, uh, configure as I mentioned earlier but of course you have to check if that's possible with the chart and also by ATC then set the go around altitude once uh, final app is engaged so you have a trigger for that it's uh, similar to a glide slope star go around altitude uh, whatever it is uh, set and in this case when final up becomes green then you can set the go around altitude if you fly too high above the VDEF final approach might not engage so be ready to use selected initially uh, this um, could be an issue if you uh, force the aircraft to fly higher than the coded path or if the platform altitude is a non-standard altitude and you, you cannot set it in the FCU for example um, 3,010 uh, feet you can't set it in the FCU so you have to round it up to 3,100 feet but the uh, VDEF path might then, uh, will then be below you and it might not intercept that so just be careful of that Continuing with a fully managed approach, um, use a uh, final app cannot maintain descent angles steeper than 3.8 degrees and uh, use another mode in this case. Now this number I noticed from experience in the FCOM it does mention that uh, very steep paths, vertical paths uh, cannot be flown using final app, it doesn't give you a number. but we used, to have, we used to have an approach where I think it was 3.9 or 4 degrees initially and it will definitely not uh, be able to fly that so you might have to do open descent speed up or use a higher vertical speed and then select the speed book down to make sure the thrust is at idle either way you have to, you have to use an, another mode initially for that there is no need to use the bird flight director on the approach if you use final app as you can see here, this will be a VR approach using Final App, and let me just wait for it until it engages here. So you, you can keep using the normal flight director. So there's no need to select the track FPA mode on the FCU because you're not actually using um, FPA, and uh, at the moment the autopilot is still on, so there's no need to uh, select a different mode here. Uh, however, if you if you select the uh, autopilot off, you do want to do that. And that's why the call is, let me see here, autopilot off, flight directors off, uh, set runway track, and bird on. Because um, 
okay so now we have the bird but you need that bird for because that's easier to fly with but the flight tracks actually are not in use so in this case that's a, it's a slightly different situation so for a single engine on some aircraft and which aircraft that applies to you have to get this information from the FCOM and on some aircraft aircraft it is not permitted to use the autopilot and uh, using a non-precision approach in final up or nav but in that case you can either use uh, final up with the autopilot off or um, uh, or final app with the autopilot of and the flight tractors on or use track FBA mode but uh, with the autopilot on so you can choose that but again you have to check this in the FCOM if that applies to your aircraft be fully configured by the final descent point for early stabilized approach for a single engine if the final descent point is at the platform altitude select flap full when you start to descend or plan to land with flap 3 because you can't fly level with single engine and gear down and flap full. I have a video of a fully managed approach and you can find the link in the description below. Now a managed selected approach, so NAV FPA. This is a higher workload than a fully managed approach and a lower workload than fully selected approach. You should practice this because it's not that easy. Um, need to calculate where the descent point should be when non-standard altitudes are used converted from meters so here's an example of non-standard altitudes the reason these altitudes are so strange they are converted from the AIP where the meters are used and but of course you cannot set this altitude in the FCU so you have to round it up at 2000 feet in this case but it means that the point where you start the descent is not the same so you will have to recalculate that Selected vertically is required initially if the continuous descent starts before when the final descent point is, is the active waypoint and after that you can arm the approach and this is the case what I mentioned earlier that if the point here is the final descent point that you have to wait until passing this waypoint before you can arm the approach but if the the descent starts uh, before that then you need to do that selected initially otherwise you will get too high so uh, in that case you will uh, start you calculate where you have to start to descent and I will talk later about how to do that but um, you, you, you will select the descent initially and then once the final descent point is active then you can arm the approach when you are high you want to uh, set at least uh, 3.5 degrees down and then uh, monitor the vertical speed. This is because if you set 3.1 degrees or 3.2 degrees, this is uh, this will not give you a high enough vertical speed in order to go back on your profile. Don't forget to set the go around altitude because there's no FMA trigger. Like with a fully managed approach, you will get um, final app in green and that will be a trigger to set the go around altitude but if you do this selected there will be no such trigger so don't forget to set the go around altitude also don't forget to do the landing checklist because the workload is higher continuing using a managed and selected approach the aircraft will balloon if flap 2 or more is selected it always does that um, to reduce the workload be fully configured before starting on the, the descent on final and then also when modifying the FPA don't forget to set the FPA back to the normal value once you are back on path and I have an example of uh, a flight here into a Bumitot where initially we were low so uh, uh, sm a lower vertical path was set, the FPA of 2.6 degrees in this case but then uh, uh, we ended up um, slightly high and the pilot flying forgot to uh, because the pilot flying forgot to set this back to 3 degrees so you don't want to forget that. The other thing about flap balloon so at the moment we have uh, flap 2 now flap 3 selected now watch the balloon here goes the balloon now flap full selected and it balloons quite a bit you see and then you're getting high on profile and that increases the workload um, now this is recognized and then three degrees set but of course that's not enough because then you will just parallel that track and 
uh, they're getting really high now and and higher FBA is at 3.1 degrees that's really not enough look at your vertical speed it's only 600 feet a minute which is about half your ground speed so that will not uh, solve anything now uh, this actually resulted in a go around because we got too high so you, there's um, several reasons uh, why this went wrong but uh, one thing you want to be fully configured before you start to descend on a vertically selected approach to prevent this flat balloon to reduce the workload but if you do get high or low you have to set an F uh, FPA which, which makes sense and, and um, 3.1 degrees or 3.2 degrees when you're high is, is just not enough For single engine, again, I mentioned this before, but don't fly uh, level with flap flow, flap flow and gear down. At uh, one mile before the descent point, pre-select the FPA in degrees. You can do this earlier, but you have to turn the button uh, once every 45 seconds because it turns, uh, it uh, times out and then the window will close. So uh, one mile before, select if the vertical path is three degrees, set three degrees, or if you have uh, under high workload, you can maybe set it earlier, but then just uh, turn the knob uh, backward to forward to keep it uh, alive, the, keep the window alive so it doesn't time out. Fly a level segment before the descent on final in order to pull 0.3 miles before. So if you fly continuously, if you're descending continuously, of course, it doesn't really make sense to uh, 3.3 miles before pull because you're already um, in selected vertically. So in order to standardize things a bit and, and make it a bit easier, you want to have a level segment and then 0.3 miles before the point we should start to descend, you can pull FPA. You want to calculate if the initial segment is steeper and if so, what that angle is. Now, how to calculate that? You can find this in the book. But there's an example. In, in this case, actually, it's not steeper, but you cannot really see this from the chart. Um, you have to calculate it. But let's say this, this initial segment here is steeper than three degrees. You want to know how much that is in case you do this selected. Because, of course, you have to set that number in the FCU. And again, how to do that, you can find it in the book. I have a link in the description below. Set the go-around altitude or the next platform altitude when starting the descent. But as I mentioned before, you have to be careful it doesn't go into alt star if you set a lower altitude when you are descending. And I have a video of a managed selected approach in the description below. There's a link. So now a selected selected approach, so track FPA. This has the most workload of all the VOR approaches. And because you need to keep the aircraft on the lateral track in addition of the, all the other things you have to do. Many points from the managed selected approach uh, are also applicable for the selected selected approach. The selected selected approach, so fully selected, is only needed when the difference between the FMS coding and the lateral track is more than one degree, the approach is not in the database and was manually built, or NAV accuracy is low. But these things, they can change. Uh, Airbus changes things in the, FMS, in the um, FCOM and FCTM quite often, so please, uh, as with uh, anything in this presentation, really, uh, please check your company manuals if it's still valid. For a selected selected approach, configuring is the same as with a managed selected approach. And also you need to be within 5 degrees of the final approach track in order to start the descent on final. But this applies to all approaches, including an um, uh, NDB approach and, and um, uh, ILS approach. Uh, all, if you do it managed or selected, it doesn't matter. You, have to, you always have to be within 5 degrees in order to start the descent. Uh, okay, about the VOR high check table. An uh, example uh, high table from an approach with a chart with issues here. So you could find uh, an, an, a, an high check table on the approach chart. Now, there's several ways this can be laid out. With Jeppesen, it's actually um, horizontal, but uh, the idea is the same. So you have uh, uh, DME distances and the altitude you should be at. 
and there could be some issues with this uh, sometimes uh, one of the, uh, the the distance checks is just plainly missing and uh, usually it doesn't go to about 15 miles and sometimes the height checks they kind of end a bit short of the runway so you can extend this yourself so in this case, you cannot fly at uh, 2,830 feet, and this has to be rounded up to 2,900 feet. Now, again, these altitudes you will only f uh, find in airspace where the, the all the altitudes from the ARP are converted from meters into feet, and then, and then you get these non-standard altitudes. If if you fly in airspace where everything is based on feet anyway, this this won't be an issue. But but here, of course, you cannot set this in the FCU, so you have to round it up to 2,900 feet, and then you can't descend at 11 miles. It will not work uh, because um, if you do that, then you will descend too late. And in this case, you want to uh, add some additional height checks beyond uh, six miles. You want to calculate the feet per nautical mile, so the difference between two height checks, which are one mile apart. So you'll just pick uh, any um, any two points, for example, eight and nine miles, and you calculate the difference between those. And to make sure it's it's um, and the same, sometimes it's it, they are about 10 feet different, but you can see what the average is to figure out what the feet per nautical mile is. Then copy the height checks on a piece of paper and extend it both ways to about 15 miles. So you can do some more height checks when you're further away. <coughs> so this is an example. Uh, this is just what, what I do. Of course, you don't have to do it exactly like this, but it's just to give you an idea. What I'll do is I'll write on the piece of paper all the height checks. So the, initially I copy paste the same numbers to make sure that there's no errors in calculation. And then I calculate uh, the missing number. So if I calculate it uh, from this chart here, that the difference of uh, bet between each uh, height check is, so if the feet per nautical mile, in this case, would be 320 feet per mile, then I just add it to the table here. So here I subtract 320 feet, and then get the number and subtract 320 feet again. And here, for to extend the other way, you just add 320 feet, so plus 320, plus 320, plus 320, etc. And then you will get the, a, a fully high check, uh, one high check table which is fully um, finished like that. And also, if there's one high check missing, you can do the same thing. So um, then you want to write down the calculated descent point and where to pull FPA. But again, that's only relevant if these non standard altitudes are used. And also write on a piece of paper the uh, the runway track and the approach track, what and the difference between those. So with the platform altitude of 2,900 feet, the descent point is somewhere between 11 and 12 miles. You can see that here. You can just look uh, look that up visually. So if again you can't set uh, 2,830 in the FCU, so you have to run it up to 2,900, and you can just look at the table here well that must be between these two somewhere between these two height checks here there is the point where i need to descend then you need to pick one height near the platform altitude for example 11 miles then calculate the difference in feet so 2900 feet minus 2830 is 70 feet right so you fly here you fly 2900 feet and then pick a reference point. You can pick 11 miles or 12 miles. So in this case, we'll pick 11 miles as a reference. So the difference uh, from 2830 feet to 2900 feet, that is 70 feet different. Then calculate the difference in miles. So if 320 feet is one mile, then how much is 70 feet? You can do cross multiplication and the answer will be 0 0.2 miles. Make sure you use the correct reference. So we use 11 miles as the reference. So it'll be 0.2 miles offset from 11 miles. That will be our descent point. So I use the correct DME offset. 11 miles as the reference. The calculated descent point is 11.2 miles. So you write that down in that box. So 11 at 11.2 miles, which equals 2,900 feet for the platform altitude. And then you add when you have to pull FPA. So at 11.5 miles, which I'll 0.3 miles before that you pull FBA. Then add the runway track, the approach track with the difference and some other in information. Of course you can write anything you like, but what I do, 
write the ident, which for which approach it is, how many feet per mile, and the amount of degrees, and I'm write um, uh, design a little runway like that. And for example, the uh, inbound of the runway track is 0902. The inbound track is 089, so the difference is three degrees. This will give you a bit of a visual picture of where to look for the runway. And also, if uh, pilot flying says autopilot of flight directors of said runway track, ah, so we have it ready here, the runway track. There you go. So the FMS vertical coding. Okay, the, there's three different ways the vertical path can be coded. So here's a picture of these three different uh, methods. Now it's important to know what to expect. Um, so if only one degree slope in the FMS is coded, the aircraft will dive and drive. So no continuous descent is flown. So if you see that here, so in this case, there's two degree paths. So if this uh, degree path, three degree path is missing and only this one is available, then the aircraft will dive and drive. So the aircraft will fly like this. So it will fly at the platform altitude and will shove the nose down until it will fly level at the altitude, which is uh, coded for the final approach fix. Then another version is um, if there are two successive three degree slope entries. So you can see that here. In this case, there's two successive three degree slope entries. Then the aircraft will either do two different things. The final, if the final descent path altitude uh, is the same as a charted platform altitude, then it will overfly the final descent path and descend later like in this case. So looking at the FMS again, so you have to look for this altitude here. So if this altitude is the same as the charted altitude on the platform altitude, then it will fly level at that point and then descend later. So it will fly like this. It will, it will keep flying level, it will overfly the descent point, it will overfly the charted descent point, and at some point later it will start to descend to fly a continuous descent. But if the final descent point altitude is higher than the charted platform altitude, then the, FM, the aircraft will fly above the platform altitude and descend at the final descent path, of the final descent point, I should say. So it will fly like this. So again, you have to look at the uh, MCDU. So we're looking for this. So if this altitude is higher than whatever is on the chart, for example, for let's say 4,000 feet, then the aircraft will fly higher at the than the platform at the platform altitude to be higher than the charted altitude, and it will start to descend at the same point which is on the chart to in order to fly a continuous descent. If no continuous descent is coded, then it's better to use selected vertically initially. But again, this depends on your company policy. About handling. If the VR approach is an offset approach, it's important to know uh, where you should look for the runway and how to turn final if there's a crosswind. So let's use this as an example. So here's the runway. This is the extended stand line from the runway, not on the FMS, but visually. And here's a windsock to indicate where the wind is coming from. And this is the final approach track from the uh, VOR approach, uh, which is offset in this case. Okay, so if the wind is coming from this direction, the aircraft has more or less uh, this uh, heading, and where we look for the runway will be on the on the left side. So looking slightly to the left, the runway should be somewhere over there. But if the wind is more from the right or or, or stronger, then the aircraft will fly into the wind more. That has a, a larger crab angle. So we're looking for the runway even more so to the left, and also. Uh, once we uh, disconnect the autopilot and we want to align the aircraft with the visually extended runway center line, when to um, uh, turn final, okay, so because there's a lot of crosswind, we have to uh, fly a bit further and then uh, turn final somewhat uh, later. But in this case, uh, because there's less crosswind, or perhaps the wind is even from the other side, uh, the, the, when you turn final, the, the arc, so to say, you, the aircraft will, will fly, is somewhat larger. So you have to uh, turn uh, uh, 
turn left a, a bit earlier. So first you turn right to fly towards the sent line and then turn left somewhat earlier than you would do in this case. Okay, here's another example. So there is still a crosswind from the right, but in this case, the approach track is offset from the right instead of from the left side. So the aircraft will still have a crab angle and we're looking for the runway on the left side of um, the, the uh, on the left side of the cockpit so to say but if the wind is from the other side uh, in this case you will fly more or less uh, straight down that approach track you we, you look for the runway straight ahead so it really depends where the wind is coming from and also what the approach track is where you have to look for the runway and when you have to start to turn final you want to disconnect the autopilot not too late and also not too early, usually about 1500 feet above the airfield, airfield elevation, if you're visual, of course, that works out uh, quite well, but it, it really depends how much the um, offset approach is. Then you say the pilot flying will say autopilot off, flight director off, set runway track, and uh, you can say bird on if the bird is not already on. Um, the bigger the approach, the, the bigger the offset approach, the earlier you have to disconnect the autopilot. Now, how to align the aircraft with the runway center line or the approach track offset? When breaking out of cloud, don't fly towards the runway initially, but observe the crosswind first. This is a classic mistake, and I've suddenly, uh, certainly done this myself also, that if there's a crosswind, um, and suddenly you see the runway, there's a tendency to, work, to turn towards the runway and, and disconnect the autopilot and then turn towards the runway. But of course, don't forget, because of the crosswind, you should have a, a crab angle. So take that into account. Then you want to fly uh, visually fly towards the extended uh, runway center line and note the crosswind. Uh, you want to roll out early or late, depending on the wind direction and speed, and align the flight path vector uh, with the track line on the primary flight display. I have a uh, video to uh, show this. Okay, so here the autopilot's just been disconnected. Uh, first, we um, we fly to the uh, slightly to the right to intercept the extended runway center line. It's a bit hard to see here, um, but the extended runway center line lies to the right. So we're turning to the right like that, and then we wait a bit, and then when to roll out uh, to the others uh, back to the left again, it depends on the wind. So there's a bit of a st strongish crosswind from the right. So we have to turn um, turn left uh, somewhat uh, later than we normally would do. Okay, so we'll, here we turn left again and to place the aircraft on the extended, visually extended Roma center line. And once you are in the middle, then you just align the, um, the bird with uh, the track line. Now, uh, vertically, um, if you are high, then you want to increase the vertical speed and uh, not more than a thousand feet a minute below 1000 feet above the uh, above the airfield elevation until you're back on your vertical path and then reduce the vertical speed to half your ground speed and keep it there in order to stay on the vertical path. And similarly, when you are um, uh, low, you want to reduce the vertical speed until you're back on path and then increase it to half the ground speed again once you are back on path. So again, the vertical path, if the brick is available and it's valid, now how do you know? Because you did your height checks before, so then you can see if it's valid or not. Then you can please use this because that will definitely reduce the workload. And then you want to fly half your ground speed in vertical speed uh, if you're on path on the vertical path and if you're high fly 1000 feet a minute back until you're back on the vertical path and if you're low reduce the vertical speed until you're back on path and then fly the half the ground speed again you want to keep monitoring the vertical speed and the outside picture so what distance to use it's very important there are three uh, different uh, sources uh, for the distance and it's important to use the correct one uh, when you are not on an inbound track, uh, use the FMS flight plan distance for profile calculation. But you have to add two miles, usually two miles, it's not always. Uh, uh, whatever the track miles is missing from the track. Because the um, FMS distance, uh, is, is uh, if that's missing the two miles, that the last two miles from the uh, approach track, then your profile calculation will not be, uh, not be uh, correct. Uh, when you are on an inbound track, uh, use the FMS uh, progress 
uh, page diff, uh, distance to uh, if you have the runway threshold selected in order to, to determine when to configure and use the VOR DME from the navigation display for the height checks. So again here uh, VOR approach so on the, the bottom corner here uh, there's the distance of the, uh, the flight plan track but this will uh, be not correct you have to add two miles to that to get the real distance to the runway threshold this will be used for the profile calculation to figure out if we're high or low on profile then uh, once you are on the final track and only only then then the distance to the threshold here if you are selected distance to as the runway threshold this distance will be exactly the distance to the threshold so you can use that uh, depending on the type of approach you're using and for the VOR height check we use the the distance to the VOR the VOR DME here cold weather so there's a few things different for cold weather operations uh, you want to use a larger FPA or vertical speed uh, about 3.3 uh, FPA will be a good number to start with so um, a larger FPA and vertical speed might exceed a thousand feet a minute uh, just keep it in mind in order to be stable you might want to brief that if the outside air temperature is minus uh, ISA minus uh, smaller than ISA minus 15 degrees which is and zero degrees at sea level then final up is not allowed you want to modify these altitudes so calculate this before and write it down to reduce the workload modify the platform altitude the, the final approach fix not below altitude all the high checks and the go around altitude and, and any other altitude may be flying level at some other notes the rose VR mode uh, only use it for a selected selected approach you don't have to but it's easier to track with there's no need to do uh, to use rose VR mode for a managed selected approach and, and also not for a fully managed approach you can if you want but it's this gives you less information use arc mode mode for a fully managed or a managed selected approach um, if ATC says uh, report inbound, that means inbound at the final approach track, not inbound in the hold. Here's an example, and this actually happened to me once. So I was holding here and uh, waiting for ATC to clear me for the approach. There was uh, another air, uh, airplane waiting on the runway here for takeoff, but it didn't know that. And then when I'm flying here, they told me, uh, report of uh, you are clear for the approach report inbound okay so I'm turning uh, out of uh, inbound in the hole here and I think okay I'm, I'm inbound now so I, I told ATC I'm, I'm inbound and then suddenly they cleared this aircraft which was on the runway here uh, cleared them for takeoff and luckily uh, the pilots they knew what was going on and they saw on TCAS that I was flying in the hold here and said no no we not accept that because there's traffic above uh, very good so um, lesson learned what they what ATC meant is that a report inbound it means report inbound in the procedure so one you have to fly outbound on the procedure here turn left and then here you are turning final and now you're inbound in the procedure and that's where you report inbound and then they can let this aircraft which was standing here and clear them for takeoff so you're clear of that traffic so please keep that in mind if you are flying manual then don't use the bird flight director because it's really hard to fly with um, you shouldn't really fly a um, manual uh, on a VOR approach anyway uh, but there might be a situation uh, where you have to do that in that case um, you, it's, it's better just to um, either not use any flight director at all and if, but if you do don't use FPA so use just vertical speed uh, that slightly increases the workload for the pilot monitoring because you have to modify the vertical speed uh, depending on the ground speed but it definitely makes it a lot easier to fly uh, the flying on the bird flight director is, is really something you should avoid uh, don't use the final approach fix as a reference when to be fully configured because at some airports the final approach fix is very low so uh, like at 1500 feet so you don't want to look at the final approach fix at all to decide when you have to lower the gear etc you want to look 
at the distance to the threshold and multiply that by three and then you know how high you are above the airfield and that's a much better way to uh, use it as a reference but either way if you fly uh, vertically selected it's uh, much better to be fully configured before you start the approach uh, before you start the final descent so more notes if only one three degree path is coded then the final descent point is at the final approach fix so beware of configuring too late and also flap balloon make sure the Q&H is correct otherwise the VDEF uh, and the, or the brick will also be incorrect and the high checks will be incorrect as well some VOR approaches although rare use two different VORs in this case, make sure you use the correct distance to configure and start the descent. Don't select FPA mode unless you are turning final, otherwise you can't use uh, VS mode and VS mode is easier to use uh, for descent management. Some FMS versions uh, cut the corner short when you're turning final and in that case you want to select uh, Direct2. And you can see that here. So here you can see that the FMS actually cuts the corner short. You, you want to, in this case, go direct to and then to this, this waypoint here to prevent the FMS from cutting the corner short because you should really be within five degrees in order to start the descent. So this you don't want to do. But again, it depends on the FMS version. They don't all do that. So that was it. If you have any questions, please leave it in the comments below.